I grew up in a farm in northern Ohio, town of Spencer, Ohio, Medina County. I didn't plan on going to college after I graduated. I just thought I'd go into business with Dad and get bigger. And bought a bunch of steers, and I lost my shirt. The price went down. So I said, Dad, I might as well go to college. So I took the first two years at Ohio State, uh, all pre-vet courses. But I got caught up back then in ROTC. I got my pilot's license at Don Scott Field my sophomore year, and I decided what I'd do is I'd switch to animal science, graduate in four years, go in the Air Force, spend three years as a fighter pilot, come back and go through the vet school as a GI Bill. Well, I got into the Air Force, and uh, uh, I never did come back, and I did very well. So well, in fact, that Paul finished first in all four of his pilot training classes. He was good enough to represent the United States Air Force against all the European NATO countries in a four-day gunnery meet. He won the meet, but everyone is vulnerable in war. I got shot down on a bombing run on my 69th mission, and I uh, got shot down two weeks before I normally would have come home. I was bombing the headquarters of the Western Vietnam Military Training Area, where they train all their GIs to go down south. And it's ironic that two days earlier than that, uh, I was escorting two RF-101 taking pictures. And I told my backseater, I said, you know, Kurt, if you need to get shot down, this would be the ideal place because there's no rice paddies, which you can't hide in, like the South. And there's no sharp karst ridges, which will spill your parachute. And I learned one thing uh, after that, I never ever speak anything into existence like that, like God spoke the world into existence. We shouldn't have gone in that day. The weather was too low. We normally roll in at 10,000 feet above the train. We were down to 3,000 feet. I was flying number two position, and we just did a big wide circle, and they were tracking us the whole time. And number two position is the is uh, probably the most dangerous because they fire on one and they correct and hit two. The plane caught on fire right away and they got up in the clouds and my backseater finally ejected and I waited till he got out. By then the fire was almost upon me and the airplane was rolling over and the stick froze over my leg. If I had ejected normally it would have lost my leg. So I undid my leg restrainers and brought it over and, and I reached up here for my ejection uh, loop and it came right out of my hands and I was digging down here for the alternate and that's when I, I bailed out, bent over and I shot out at about 27 G's and I blacked out. When I woke up, I was hanging my parachute and they were shooting up at me and uh, I remember saying, you don't want to land in a tree. So I saw the only tree around there and I was guiding my parachute to miss it. And uh, I landed right in it, which thank God, I didn't know I had a broken back. And I just made a tiptoe landing and I pulled my chute down and hit it and uh, ran up a ridge and uh, got captured real quick. We marched all day back to the place that I bombed and uh, my back hurt so bad that day, I just laid down in the road and I couldn't walk anymore. And they hooked a rope onto me and they started dragging me and they saw blood, I guess, on the ground and they stopped and finally got there and they found a Jeep and, or a six by six and put me in it that night. I tried to escape and they caught me right away because it was right in the middle of a training area. There was thousands of them around. The Hanoi Hilton is the big prison at the French built to hold the Vietnamese in when they were colonialists. I was the 12th one captured out of 661. Initially, they interrogated us four times a day, and then they finally went, you know, three, two, one, because they got new people coming in all the time. I didn't give them anything but name, rank, and serial number. And they, I think, were pretty mad at me, and that's why they didn't let me ride home. The torture was pretty bad. So I said, uh, I, I could probably tell you how we plan on shooting your aircraft down. And it was all made up, just sort of enough so they might believe it, but uh, I set it up so we would actually be the beneficiary. And uh, they brought in their wing commander, or the head of their Air Force, I don't know, but he was real spiffy. 
and uh, he was smoking cigarettes and uh, taking notes and all that. And then they eased off of the torture program, and about a month later, they yanked me out in the middle of the night and almost killed me. And I figured they'd realize I lied to them. And uh, shortly thereafter, another POW was shot down, and they brought him in, and we were tapping through the wall, and he said, the first time the MiGs really came up to fight with us, they lost three. And I think the wing commander, whoever interviewed me, uh, said, you know, we've been had. And I think that's probably the prime reason they didn't let me uh, ride home for five years. Another way they tried to get even with me is they didn't feed me very well. I was shot down at 173 and I got down 103. And that's why I destroyed my central optic nerve and I have no vision in the center of either eye. And when I look right at you, I can't even see your nose. They never did anything about my back. I was in a lot of pain the whole time. During interrogation, they put you on a concrete block and it hurt so bad I'd just fall off of it. And they'd beat you around and uh, put you back on there. And you just live from day to day. Hopefully tomorrow it'd be better. I'd been in and out of solitary confinement probably three and a half years out of eight. It took me almost a year to teach a guy on the other side of the wall the tap code by not talking to it. And what it is, you drop the K out of the alphabet at least 25 letters, and you line them up, A, B, C, D, E. And the first tap is the line, the second tap is the letter in the line. Like B would be tap, tap, tap. You got it? And uh, that's how we would communicate. Yeah, we got pretty good at it. I had never cried or had tears in my eyes the whole time I was there. And when they took us out from our cells to the airport at Guillaume, they took us in a bus. And because of my no center vision, I couldn't see the C-141 coming in as soon as some of the others. And when I finally saw it, I bit my tongue so hard to keep from having tears that I put a permanent indentation in it. And uh, then they called us by name. I was the 12th one. And a big Air Force uh, colonel in uniform wrapped his arms around me as I was halfway there. And he said, welcome home, you SOB. And I just, tears just rolled. I got to the back of the airplane where they were loading us. And uh, we were probably hundreds of feet away. And I could smell the nurse's perfume, the, the uh, pilot's and airman's aftershave. And I remember saying, man, if, any, if heaven's anything like this, I don't want to miss it. And we got in, landed at Clark Air Base in the Philippines, and they had a great welcoming for us.